share now. All right, welcome. Good afternoon. I'm pleased to be rehosting our Our Homes um, webinar and podcast series. Our guest today is Tyler Iokepa Gomes, who serves as deputy to the chair of the Hawaiian Homes Commission in the Department of Hawaiian Homelands, or DHHL. He is the second in command at DHHL. He was raised in Kailua, Oahu, and received his BA in the Hawaiian language from UH Manoa and JD and certificate in Native Hawaiian law from the UH Richardson School of Law. He was appointed by Governor Ige to his current position on September 30th, 2019, and subsequently confirmed by the Hawaii State Senate to serve a term ending December 5th, 2022. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Okay, so we understand you have a presentation, so please take it away. Sure. Um, <laughs> all right, so what you'll see on the, on the top of all the number of pairings is the number of applicants there are for residential land on each of the islands. Beneath that, you'll see the available acreage. The immediate clarity should be, uh, simply put, we don't have enough lands available for residential leases. In fact, uh, we are responsible for the maintenance and um, control of very large swaths of undevelopable um, preservation and conservation land, which is in, unsuitable and probably not appropriate for housing. And so one of the challenges we have to overcome is figuring out how to acquire more land. Uh, another of the challenges we face is an issue of time. Um, the current estimate is that it'll take 182 years to meet demand at our current rate, assuming no one else joins the wait list. Uh, we know from a recent study that we did in 2020 that over half of our wait listers are over the age of 60. And we know that at least 2,000 Native Hawaiians have passed away while waiting um, on the waiting list. And these are unacceptable figures. These are things that motivate us every day to do the work that we do. Uh, but it does put into light the immediacy of trying to solve this problem. And then the final issue that the department regularly faces is an issue of funding. And um, for context, our, our budget request for fiscal 22-23 was about 145.9 million. Um, our actual appropriation for fiscal 21, so this current fiscal year was 20 million. And we estimate that it would take approximately four and a half to maybe even six billion conservatively just to provide infrastructure to develop um, a lot for every single person on the wait list. And so, you know, this is a, a massive gap that we need to strategically try to figure out how to fill. Uh, there's been no shortage of creative ideas to try and accomplish that, but I think it, um, what we've been able to do is move that conversation along. So what you're seeing here now is sort of a, a mapping of the percentage and in increase in a few things. Um, at the top of the chart, you'll see the number of applications that have increased from 1976 to present, right? It's a particularly large spike uh, in about 1985, and then it just never stops. Um, and the same is true sort of for the number of leases we've given out in pink. The number here that I think is really important is when we look at the number of authorized positions in the department, the blue line, it never really increases at the rate that everything else does, which should impress upon people that the department has been expected to do a lot and a lot more each and every year after that with a relatively unchanging level of staff, which can be very difficult. This is a, a similar sort of mapping of the funding we've received in terms of CIP, which is in yellow, um, and general funds, which is in purple. And you'll see that for many years, there was relatively no change uh, in the amount of money received uh, up until recently, maybe in the last six, seven years. And so when all of that is looked together in context, you see that we have a very, very large problem that's been um, met with the challenge of having, you know, a limited amount of staff and a, little, a limited amount of funding. One thing that I think people 
are always interested in is the fact that we do lease out some of our land for commercial purposes. So we've got about 203,000 acres in the inventory. We lease approximately 2,800 of that for general leasing, which are long-term leases. That generates about 15.7 million in annual income for the department, um, which seems like a lot of money, I think, you know, from, from the general public's perspective, but when you consider the amount of money we need and how much each project costs, you know, 15 million a year doesn't do enough for the department. And so what I want to focus on is now is some past initiatives that the department has undertaken to sort of help solve this problem um, that don't necessarily involve asking for more money or more staff. It just involved a lot of creativity. So one of those things was called the Quiliana Land Awards. Those were awards we made for undeveloped lots. Uh, and the idea was that it would provide for lots in a more rural setting uh, with limited infrastructure, meaning just roads. And it would be up to those who accepted leases in those areas to figure the rest out themselves. And th there was demand for that. Um, but really it challenged beneficiaries to sort of make the most of a very basic award. Similarly, we also did something called Accelerated Lot Awards, similar to the Kuliana Land Awards, except we uh, committed to providing the infrastructure in the long term. Um, it just involved putting people on the land first, and then the department made a long-term commitment to one day coming back and finishing the infrastructure. We did a survey. Uh, the overall satisfaction with the Accelerated Lot Awards program was not particularly high. Um, third, we've tried something called und undivided interest that was done in the 2000s. And essentially that was different, right? Kuliana Land Awards and Accelerated Awards gave awards for actual lots. Undivided interest, and that shouldn't say lots, it should say awards, I'm sorry, but undivided interest provided people a paper lease, which basically means they received a lease to uh, a um, unspecified lot that would one day be developed. And what that allowed folks to do was get off of the wait list. An undivided paper lease would be um, inheritable. You could pass it on to a successor, unlike your place on the wait list. And you would wait until a lot in a certain area was developed and then your paper lease would be good for a lot there. Um, one of the challenges with undivided interest was we gave out so many of them, it did bring the numbers down. Uh, however, we weren't prepared to develop all of those lots right away. To this day, we are still developing to make up for all of those undivided interest leases that were uh, given out almost 20 years ago. Um, another thing that we've tried is uh, Kupuna rental housing. We have a Kupuna rental housing project in Waimanalo, which is in high demand and filled. And I think that that's been particularly successful and sort of inspires the department to think about other ways to provide housing to Native Hawaiians that don't necessarily involve them getting the 99 year lease on our lands, which as a term of the act, but it does address the larger problem, which is how do we house our people. Um, and the same is true of Holy Malima, which was a rent to own project here in Kapolei, uh, which essentially gave people the opportunity to rent for 15 years. And then at the end of the 15 years, they could own, um, they could mortgage and own the remainder of, of the project. And it sort of gave people who maybe weren't ready with the down payment, the opportunity to um, save and prepare over that 15 year period and eventually get into housing. And so all of these things, I think are the product of a department that, like I mentioned, was faced with a lot of challenges, but came up with a lot of cre creative ways to try and address the problem. And I think that that's the spirit of what we need to embrace in terms of solving Hawaii's affordable housing crisis. The benefit is the Department of Hawaiian Homelands has 100 years of experience uh, trying to solve these problems. And so, you know, at the risk of history being cyclical, you know, the state, the rest of the state, you know, and all others who are involved in sort of addressing the housing crisis and proposing solutions, you know, the department should really be seen as an example of what's been tried and what's worked and what hasn't in terms of um, sort of meeting the need. I wanted to go over some statistics that I think people will find interesting about the department. You know, 
what I hope people get out of you know that last slide is while yes we are often measured by how rapidly we're solving the issue of our waitlist you know there are ways to provide assistance that don't necessarily impact the waitlist but do impact in Hawaiian lives um, and so as a result I wanted to provide some insight into you know who are the people on our waitlist and what is a picture of what that person looks like. So we did a beneficiary study at the end of 2020 that was released. Um, of that study, we were able to sort of estimate that of the 28,000 folks on the wait list, about 58% want a residential lease. Now, under the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act, you can accept a residential, you can accept an agricultural lease, or you can um, not accept, but apply for an agricultural lease, or you can apply for a pastoral lease. Uh, residential has been and continues to be the product in highest demand. Uh, this is true since the 80s, and it's also true of why the department has particularly focused on providing residential lots. When surveyed, 53.9% um, of our, our applicants on the waitlist indicated they want, wanted a move-in ready single family, what we call a turnkey house, uh, which is you know, the product that we primarily focus on. Um, I think for a lot of people, it's a metric that they can readily understand and picture. So we are often looked at as a housing department, which isn't necessarily true, but it is, you know, the, the one thing that I think the majority of our families would like. Their second choice is something, we call it a vacant lot, but essentially what it is, is an undeveloped lot with infrastructure in place. And um, that gives the beneficiary the flexibility and the ability to build what they want on the lot, knowing that water, sewer, and electric are already in place and the department has put that there. That typically comes out of the department's pocket anyway when we develop. Our average is about $150,000 out of the department's pocket to put in water, sewer, and electric. Um, when we look at the applicant list, almost 85% want three or more bedrooms. and that is significant not only because the nature of, I want to say, multi-generational living and the size of, you know, families, but it's also indicative of what the cost is to, to develop that. I mean, the reality of developing, you know, I don't, let's say 15,000 three-bedroom homes, three or more bedroom homes, that can be very costly. That's not necessarily in a price point that's attainable for everybody, but it represents the majority of the demand. And then in terms of household size, 67% of our applicants have between one and four people in their household. Um, some additional statistics. Interestingly, 48% of those on our wait list are already homeowners. Um, and when you talk to them, many are on the wait list because they are trying to um, benefit their families. They're trying to use their qualification so that they can pass it on to a successor who is usually a child or a grandchild, someone of 25% native Hawaiian or greater. Um, and when you think about it like that, you know, that's someone who is currently waiting for a house in Hawaii anyway. Um, if the department can assist in that, you know, we are freeing up free, uh, the demand for fee simple inventory by being able to provide these lots. 35% of our households make an annual income of $50,000 to $99,000 a year. That's, I mean, this is the largest grouping out of all the income brackets. That's not a lot of money. I think we can be candidly honest about that, which sort of makes the importance of this work that much more um, real, I guess, is knowing that these are families who are in desperate need of affordable housing solutions. These are some uh, statistics about those who remain on the waitlist. 48.6% of the waitlist have received an award and turned it down more than three times. Of those who turned it down at least once, so not the three or more, but anyone who's turned down an award, 30, uh, almost 35% of them turned down the award because they weren't ready to accept it. Um, and that's interesting to point out because it didn't mean they weren't ready financially. We had a separate category for those who were financially unable to qualify. These are folks who just felt that they weren't in a place to accept. 50, almost 51% of the waitlist, those who have turned down an award, turned it down due to the location. And the only way we're going to solve that problem, like I said, is acquiring more land and money to develop in more favorable areas. But um, when we keep this in perspective, 
and folks sort of grade the department on the length of the wait list and grade the department on how long folks have been on the wait list, it's important to put it back into perspective and say that there are a lot of multifaceted challenges to meeting the needs of Native Hawaiians. And it's not always as simple as um, there are 28,000 people waiting in line, you're not doing anything about it. So these are some current and future initiatives that we are contemplating that I think help to address this crisis from DHL's perspective. We're still working on that Kuleana Land Award program. Um, we have additional sites for Kuleana Land Awards, which again, just reminding folks, provides people undeveloped raw land to do with as they please, which there is demand for. I mean, it's not the majority of our beneficiaries, they don't want that, but there are folks who do. Um, we are continuing, we just awarded 60 new rent with option to purchase lots in Kona two weekends ago. Um, and it's a really exciting opportunity just to see people come in who, again, aren't ready to do maybe a down payment on a house, but can absolutely afford to rent a property for 15 years with the option to own that property after that 15 years is up. Uh, double skipped, but um, many people know that we're working on condominium rentals in the urban core of Honolulu and Mo'ili'ili. Um, and what was great about that project is the developer came in and the developer will bear 100% of the cost. So it doesn't cost the department anything in that particular project that's on the site of the former Bolodrome um, to do more rentals. And we know that there are beneficiaries on the list who are interested in condominium living, uh, who are interested in renting. Um, and so again, maybe not addressing the wait list, but re-metricizing what the department can do to sort of provide housing units. And then a, um, a recent initiative that the commission approved is a fee simple down payment assistance program, which is still in the works of figuring out the details, but I'm excited to talk about it in the sense that this is a very creative way for us to assist beneficiaries. And the commission is interested in, okay, if someone is on the wait list and they are ready to buy a home in the fee simple world, so off of Hawaiian homelands, uh, any unit, what can the department do to provide uh, assistance in the down payment and you know what does that look like for the department is there a first right of refusal so that, so that the property comes into department inventory um, should uh, should the beneficiary choose to sell these are all things that have to be worked out nothing set in stone but I think that sort of creativity that the commission is expressing and figuring out how to provide additional routes to um, residency for, for Native Hawaiians is incredibly important. And so this is the uh, end of, I guess, the formal slideshow that I prepared. Um, and Senator Chang, happy to answer any questions you might have or folks watching have. Um, yeah, thank you for that opportunity to share all of that. Well, thank you so much, Tyler. Um, participants, if you would like to ask a question, you can type it into the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, I'll begin with a question about a proposal that you um, brought to the state legislative session this year, which was to allow for our casino gambling to generate revenue to help pay for um, housing development. Can you tell us about that initiative, the current status, and why you thought it would have been a good idea? Sure. Uh, the casino bill, I mean, we'll start with the status. The casino bill for this legislative session is, uh, I mean, dead is the, is the best word for it, um, which means that it, it didn't pass out of any of its legislative committees. Um, we were fortunate enough to have a hearing in the Senate. And, you know, the casino bill was proposed as one way to sort of fill the funding gap. And I wouldn't say that, the, that we were immediately wed to the idea of it passing this session. We knew it would uh, provoke a lot of discussion. We knew it would provoke a lot of emotions as the discussion around casino gaming has done in Hawaii for the last 20 years. Um, but we had to, we had to try something. Um, and I think the one benefit of going through the process of proposing the casino bill was that, you know, some of the slides that I used came from our casino presentation that we had done repeatedly. What that allowed us to do is get Native Hawaiians and even non-Native Hawaiians, a lot of our advocates and our allies to a point of like functional fluency to be able to talk about the challenges facing the department. That's a huge win because for example, this leg 
le this legislative session, it looks like our budget would be will be significantly higher than it has been in years past. And I'd say that that is a win for us. We've we've managed to successfully convey how how deep the department's need is as a result of the discussion around the casino. And I think we're seeing people respond to that. Um, and I mean, just briefly, not to belabor casino the the casino itself, but casinos have proven to be uh, very lucrative for a lot of indigenous people, not just in this uh, country, but across the world in terms of generating revenue. The state is currently challenged with the number of revenue streams that it does have. Um, I'm not saying it's the only option. I'm not saying it has to be the solution, but it definitely was an idea. And I think um, the benefit of that was we, I think we got a really healthy discussion out of, out of it. Thank you so much for the update. <laughs> Okay, um, we'll start with a question from the audience. Affordable low income rental housing seems to be at least a temporary solution to the housing issue. However, the blood quantum requirement that your department has of 50% native Hawaiian blood is a disincentive to potential housing investors, as there is no guarantee that a housing project can maintain an occupancy level to sustain operational expenses. Is it possible to adjust the mandate to provide a preference for blood quantum? And if op occupancy drops to say 90% then open to the general public and future uh, blood quantum applicants would go to the top of the wait list for a rental project like that. That's a, sort of an interesting challenge in that, you know, we've heard the concern in the past that um, potentially we wouldn't be able to meet occupancy. I think in the, in the context of um, Polo drum at this point, I think the developer feels confident that, that shouldn't be an issue. However, I think the, the bigger point to be made here is that um, under the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act, I don't think we could do that, right? It, any, any use of our land for housing purposes, I think calls for us to follow the, the mandate of blood quantum. Um, and I think it would be a disservice to those on the wait list who have been waiting for decades. Um, it would be probably, disingenuous for those who have passed away on the wait list for us to be using land to house those who are not fulfilling the minimum criteria as expressed in the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act. Um, I think we have to be really sensitive to the fact that if this land is gonna be used for housing, um, we've gotta not just comply with the act in spirit, but we should do it in, in good faith as well. Um, here's another question from the audience. Um, you mentioned in your slide earlier that many Native Hawaiians had received awards but turned them down because they were waiting for a more favorable location. What are those areas that you think Native Hawaiians would like the housing to be in? I think for a, a lot of families, um, when they say that they don't like the location, oftentimes it's not, for some it's not in the, it, it, we have a lot of residents say for in Waimanalo example, who may not live on homestead in Waimanalo, um, but they know that there are currently homesteads there. So they're waiting in the hopes that maybe perhaps that one day there'll be more opportunities in Waimanalo. I think that's a lot of it is you see people wanting to stay close to, you know, their homes, their families. Um, particularly, there are many folks who aren't interested in moving all the way across the island in whatever direction that might be. Um, and so I think when they say that, you know, it's not the right location, that's a huge part of it. But, you know, we've got to keep moving forward. And so, you know, we'll continue to develop projects. Oahu is the hardest. That is where we have the least amount of lands available for residential. So the only way to solve that problem is, you know, in the long term, we're going to have to acquire more land, whether that's by exchange or by purchase. Um, but in acquiring new land, that's one way for us to maybe find more desirable land. There are tons of areas in this island that do not have homesteads, let alone large native Hawaiian populations. I, for one, would love to see, you know, larger, I grew up in Kailua. I would love to see more native Hawaiians in Kailua. I would love to see uh, native Hawaiians in a lot of areas where they're not predominantly, predominantly represented. And I think that's a huge opportunity there, which sort of brings me to, my pitch, if you will, which is, I think, you know, solving one, okay, one, the responsibility for filling the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act is not the Department of Hawaiian Homeland's responsibility, right? We're just, we're just the arm responsible for doing it. It's the responsibility to the state of Hawaii. 
And I think that means that everyone sort of, not sort of, everyone needs to embrace that kuleana, that responsibility equally in order to help us solve it. And so I think if we're gonna have, continually have the discussion about how do we solve the affordable housing crisis, I think dedicating as many resources as possible to assisting the department in solving the wait list necessarily frees up inventory in the fee simple market and creates more units available for those who don't qualify um, under the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act. And so I would love to see every single player in the affordable housing discussion come to the table and maybe we make it a dedicated challenge to divert all resources for developing affordable housing to the Department of Hawaiian Homelands, whether it's you know, other agencies challenging themselves to assess lands that might be more suitable for us to develop for housing. And maybe we have land that's more suitable for them to maintain. That's one way to do it. Um, you know, landowners in the state who are interested in, in helping solve this problem, maybe approaching the department with proposals. You know, any way we can get land, hands, and money to this problem. To this, I think, I think it benefits everyone. So I would love to see, you know, everybody jump in on the Hawaiian Homelands uh, challenge. And if we can eliminate the wait list, I think that that, that will have broad and far reaching effects that impact all residents for the state of Hawaii. So that's a really interesting um, point. And it's one that others have also argued in public that DHHL should, should come first in, in terms of resources. You've already identified in your presentation dollars, four and a half billion dollars for infrastructure alone. You've also identified land, especially on the most populous island of Oahu as something that your department needs. Um, if the governor were to ask you, Tyler, come up with a plan to bring the wait list down to zero, what would be on that wait list? Would it just simply be a certain number of acres on Oahu plus $4.5 billion? No, it's not. I think we need um, we need additional capacity um, to do. So first of all, with the way that our budget works, like when we identify projects that have to be done, our projects take approximately six years from planning to keys in the door to completion. A lot of that has to do with the funding doesn't come in in steady streams. So we might receive the funding to do planning one year, but we may not get the funding to do the actual construction um, for several more years. And so that adds on time to projects. So I think if we can, one, get a dedicated source of funding. So in this hypothetical situation, if we get four and a half billion dollars, you know, the next step in that plan in my mind is being able to utilize um, either one, increasing the, the number of folks we have working at the department or being able to utilize more contracting services to immediately plan out um, what it would look like to develop all of the lands that are currently in the department's um, inventory, right? If we could maximize every single unit in, um, in, in our inventory, I mean, if we could maximize um, every single piece of land that we have that's available for developing homesteading and we could assess the number of units we can get out of that. I think that's the next step towards assessing, okay, well, how much more additional land will we need? Um, in addition to that, you know, infrastructure is a huge, uh, is a huge challenge, uh, particularly with water. We know there are homesteads, especially on Molokai, that still have water issues. I think a good amount of resources, time and energy, not just from this department, needs to be focused on, you know, looking closely at the way water is accounted for in the state and how water is used as a tool in terms of what can and can't be developed. Um, it proves to be a continual obstacle for this department. Um, and I think if we can get basic infrastructure planned out, if we can figure out you know, what else the department needs in terms of acquisition, then I think it's a matter of plotting out you know, with this hypothetical instant um, injection of four, four and a half billion dollars. I think it's generating all of these temporary construction jobs that would be generated um, to get people building homes. Okay, so we're one of the fundamental background assumptions you're making is that there needs to be a subsidy, some subsidy, right? So DHHL could act to build unsubsidized homes, right? What would be preventing DHHL from building 
a substantial amount of homes and then selling them um, and then recouping their costs from those sales like any other developer? I mean, I think it's a huge part of keeping the housing affordable, right? I mean, if we, if we don't subsidize it, you know, then we're looking at development costs that are equal to the feasible market. And we know that that's not feasible for, I mean, feasible for most people in the state of Hawaii, regardless of ethnicity, but especially for Native Hawaiians. Um, I think the subsidy is important because we know that even with it, there are still many families um, who, who cannot attain um, home ownership even at the prices, right? So, I mean, our homes in Kapolei went for between three hundred and five hundred thousand dollars. You're not going to get that anywhere in the fee simple market, but there were still families who could not afford that. And I think if we included the subsidy, you are essentially pricing out more Native Hawaiians from being able to attain home ownership out of our program. Okay. Um... So we have another question in the audience about um, the uh, affordability of these homes. Um, can you explain ways to um, that the department can he keep homes affordable, whether it's paying for all the offsite infrastructure, whether it's using non-traditional housing construction techniques such as modular construction, 3D printing, et cetera? Um, you know, I think I, I'm fortunate right now to work in an administration that is open to embracing all kinds of ideas. I mean, that is a huge bonus. And I would hope that, you know, we've only got a year and a half left, but I hope future administrations would be open to it. But I don't see one, yes, we are contemplating modular homes. Um, I think we need to figure out in terms of price, how best that works. Um, and I think there are some, some wrinkles we want to get out in terms of making sure that you know, financing options for beneficiaries for those modular homes are completely worked out. In terms of 3D printing, um, I know that's particularly new technology. I think there are a lot of really, really cool ways to make homes um, in addition to 3D printing, right? There are recycled materials that make almost these Lego blocks out of uh, recycled materials. Um, I think if we can find a model that works, and meets the needs of our beneficiaries, there shouldn't be a reason why we shouldn't at least consider it. Um, and anyone who has uh, ideas like that, if you've got resources available, um, who you think we should talk to, you know, you can, on our website, dhhl.hawaii.gov, by all means, please reach out because if there is a feasible option, for example, as this person mentioned, 3D printing, I'd love to look into it and see if it's a reality, if we can make it a reality. Um. Do you have any thoughts regarding areas of potential cooperation between DHHL and the neighbor island counties? Um, well, we work we work on all islands um, and we work with all county leadership. Um, I think that one of the areas that you know we're constantly mindful of is existing infrastructure infrastructure and making sure that our county governments are maintaining them. Um, you know, our, one of the challenges I think is particularly with water and wastewater um, infrastructure is the cost it takes to, to maintain that. I mean, I think our, our sufficient sums request for infrastructure maintenance, um, repairs and maintenance was in excess of $200 million. I think if the counties were willing to come to the table. And I think that there are some, I mean, there are, there are opportunities. I think working with the counties to make sure that the department isn't unnecessarily taking up um, utilities when there are agencies who are far more suited and capable of doing it, that would allow us to free up necessary resources and man hours to focus on providing housing. I think that's one area. Um, but again, we actually do have positive relationships with all the neighbor island counties. I think We've worked well with them in terms of addressing some of our needs. Um, yeah. Um, let's go back to something that you talked about earlier in your presentation, and that's um, the nature of the waitlist itself. And as you pointed out, almost half of the waitlist has already been offered and turned down um, homes multiple times. So, you know, it. The bringing the the waitlist down to zero, it 
doesn't seem like a realistic goal just by the nature of the way that waitlist is structured. Uh, is that fair to say? I mean, in other words, if I'm a, a waitlist person, even though I might be a homeowner, I might specifically be waiting for a home that is directly next door to my parents' home, you know, on a specific homestead site in Waimanalo. And so I could be offered homes, you know, 10 times, 100 times, but as long as it's not that specific home, um, there, I, I, you know, I can just maintain my place on the wait list forever and just never accept until I get the exact home that I'm, that I want. Is that fair to say? I mean, I wouldn't say it's an unrealistic or unattainable goal. I mean, I think, well, actually, I mean, with our current resource structure, the way it is, I mean, it is, it is very close to, I mean, how do you put 182 years into context? How do you tell people who have already been on the wait list? For 50 to 60 years, 40 years, 30 years, even that you know we're 182 years away from from getting everyone home. So in some ways, I see what you're saying about it being unattainable. Um, but I think I think with again going back to the lack of resources, I think with more resources, we could make a larger dent in the wait list, and I think that that's the goal, right? I I don't think anyone's expecting us to provide 28,000 units overnight. Um, but as going back to that, that chart, if you look at the way demand for, for leases in term, and that's reflected in the number of applicants, I mean, it, it spiked in the 80s. I mean, that's where the department really transitioned away from, you know, where it had been, which is primarily with an agricultural focus. And it was just housing, 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 housing. Um, one thing that I think could come from this discussion um, is maybe reassessing the way we, we I, I use the word for metricize, but how do we measure the department's success? Right now, the department externally, right in the media and by beneficiaries is assessed on how long the wait list is. Stories always make a reference to how long folks are on the wait list. When we go to the legislature for our budget every year, we are questioned about the progress we are making in addressing the wait list. Everyone um, frames the discussion in how do we solve the wait list. I think perhaps with the statistics being that, you know, folks aren't always ready for the home that they're offered, then maybe we should be looking at how many Native Hawaiians we're helping. Um, and that's where I think projects like rentals can be should be valued much more higher than they are, right? Just because they don't bring somebody off of the wait list immediately doesn't mean we should discount it. Um, in reality, we're providing people housing. There are people out there who want to rent. They're not interested in home ownership. So I think, I, I guess where I'm going with this is, I would love to say, you know, you're right, 28,000, that's unattainable. Maybe there's another way to look at it. I just don't know if externally other people are willing to look at us in any other way other than the length of the wait list and how fast we're, we're addressing it. Well, to put it another way, if half of the wait list are already homeowners, um, they have housing and they are secure in their housing, right? So in that sense, the true level of need of people who are, who are not homeowners is only about half of the 28,000. Isn't that right? you're about half of the wait list. Yeah, right, so 48% own homes currently, yeah. Is that what you're, you're referring to? Right, and you know, I don't know if it's the same 48%, but about half of the wait list has been offered housing multiple times and turned it down. So is that a different way to reframe the wait list? Non, you know, uh, non homeowner wait list members? You mean, how are we getting housing to those who don't already own a home? I don't think so. And I mean, here's why. Um, sure, maybe those families own homes. My guess is the majority of them have owned those homes for more than 10 years, probably more than 20 years, right? They've, they've had the opportunity for home, home ownership, which is far more attainable, you know, 20 years ago than it is currently, especially for people of, you know, our age. Uh, you're in my generation. I think for many of those families, we know that they're, they remain on the wait list because they're looking for a way to create generational um, housing. And so 
the house really isn't for them. It's it's for their, like I said, their children and their grandchildren, which is completely within you know what was envisioned the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act. It's a provision of the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act, so they're not doing anything. I mean, they're entitled to pass that home on, and I think you know, looking only to those who don't own a home ignores the fact that maybe there's maybe there's a 38 percenter out there who could inherit and could stand to benefit from this program, but can't be on the wait list. I don't think we, under the act, we're allowed to necessarily ignore their, their dad, for example, because he owns a home, knowing that we're skipping their opportunity um, as well. Does that make sense? That's fair. Um, but it's kind of an interesting way to frame the whole conversation. You know, um, I, I can see what you're saying, I guess. You know, Kamehameha Schools is not judged by how many Native Hawaiians are eligible for its educational services, um, but that it does not educate, right? They, you know, they have a mission and they educate only a certain fraction of the Native Hawaiian community, but not the entire Native Hawaiian community. And so um, you already stated that it's the entire state's responsibility to house every person on the wait list, which is true. Um, but you know, you can have 50%, you can have 100% Hawaiian ancestry and be happy in a home that is not provided by DHHL and maybe have no intention of moving into a home provided by DHHL. You might not, right. You might have, a, but, the, but you might have an eligible successor who would. And so I think, you know, we can't deny them that right. Um, it still goes to solving the state's affordable housing crisis, right? The likelihood is that their successor probably is waiting for an affordable housing unit anyway. Um, yeah. So, you know, I think for those of us in this conversation today, the, you know, wait list is, is a very sympathetic group of people that obviously the state should be working to um, meet their housing needs with utmost urgency. Um, Politically speaking, what do you think the obstacles have been over the years, over the century, um, you know, that have prevented DHHL from attaining this goal? Um, I think I think a large part of it is politics, right? Like, we, if we come right out and say like the department's never gotten enough funding and that's a huge problem, we have been met many times with those who believe that it's not the funding, it's the leadership. And one, I fundamentally disagree with that because it has been strong Native Hawaiians who have taken up the charge. If this job were easier, um, you know, I think we'd see more people apply for it. So I think there's sort of like a, a social and political barrier towards the way people perceive the department. But if, if we look at the reality, right, we have the benefit of having a library of 100 years of annual reports. Every single annual report going back to 1921 mentions the lack of funding. And it, it shouldn't be up to the department by itself every year trying to figure out how to come up with funds and how to spend it. I think there were some years where the department was being, I mean, the department got zero dollars several times in terms of funding. There were years where that happened. And then in addition to getting zero dollars, the department was then told, you're terrible for not getting anything done. It's, uh, you know, for lack of better terms, it's damned if you do, damned if you don't. And so I think a huge part of the problem is this department is politically unpopular. And so people, it's very easy to blame this department. It's very easy to cast it as a scapegoat. It's very easy to cast aside the fact that we're actually the, the largest affordable housing developer in the state. Um, we've managed to put 10,000 Native Hawaiian families on land, land that was meant to be second class and third class lands, which was the original designation when the act was passed. We've managed to turn those into homes and we can always do more. But I think one of the largest barriers is the department has never been able to um, effectively tell its story and speak to the wins that the department has made because it is constantly battling a mischaracterization that the department has only been and will always be a string of failures, which is not true. But I think, you know, if I'm waxing poetic right now, I think that's the hugest problem is that, you know, it's very easy people to, for people to cast this department aside, blame the leadership, say that you know nothing's getting done and use that as a justification for not providing more support. I get it, it's, as, 
It doesn't make sense to me. It's like, oh, well, you guys are terrible at your jobs. Also, here's, you know, zero dollars in that those instances where that happened. It's just, it doesn't pencil out. And I think the one benefit, right? It, it's one thing I could just complain all day about that, but I think the one benefit of what the department has been trying to do, at least in the last year and a half that I've been here, is, you know, flood people with information. I think people are genuinely interested in what is the department doing. And I think we try to do a better job of um, communicating, you know, what exactly is going on. And we can always strive to be better. So I don't want to put the image in anyone's mind that we're perfect. You know, none of us are, but I think the more the department can do to um, let people in and know what's going on, I think what we essentially do is break down this barrier that people have, because I think a lot of people, especially those, I mean, it's not just in the blind community, right? DHHL sort of says it's like a, a twitch in people's like response, no matter what community, community you're talking about it in, because it just, it comes with a very long and, you know, in many years, disappointing history. Um, one feature of Hawaiian homes lands is that they have 99 year leases on them, um, which is a policy that is also pursued by other jurisdictions, notably the nation of Singapore, um, which I've personally visited in order to research their successful housing policies. Now in Singapore, the government has been very clear in saying that after 99 years, you're out, you get nothing, you walk away with absolutely nothing. Um, in DHHL's context, of course, that's not the case. Can you describe um, the plan for DHHL uh, for what to do after 99 year leases have expired? Well, the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act actually allows for an additional 100 year extension. So there are 199 year leases. I mean, in theory, I, the first homesteads um, will be coming up on their 100 year anniversary very shortly. Um, and I mean, I can't speak for the commission, but I think the one, I would be surprised if beneficiaries didn't exercise their right to seek an 100 year extension. And I think that, again, without speaking for the commission, because I don't want to say that they're going to grant them all, I think the commission would give very good thought to the fact that, you know, especially right now, now is not the time to be displacing Hawaiian families. Um, and so, you know, if you're asking me what happens at the end of the 199 year leases, um, I don't know. Uh, I don't. I don't have the answers for everything, but I don't know how we approach leases that reach the 199 year um, mark because we don't have any one. We we haven't had to get there yet, and two, I don't think there's anything in the act that tells us what to do when we get there. Um, I imagine it will be. Right, that those those leases once they get to the 199 year mark will be have had multiple generations of families on them, so there will be a lot of emotion and um, identity tied to them. So, I, frankly, I I don't know what the plan is at the end of the 199. So speaking of the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act, if you could wave a magic wand and pass one amendment through Congress and the White House. Um, what would that one amendment be? Um, I mean, this is me speaking personally. I'm not speaking for this. I'm just going to say me speaking personally. Yeah. I think the amendment um, regarding successor successorship uh, is important, right? There are fewer and fewer 50% Hawaiians. Uh, there are fewer and fewer 25% Hawaiians. Um, I think the opportunity to allow for more Hawaiians to qualify is speaking again, me personally, I think is um, important. Uh, I'm lucky enough, you know, my dad is a qualifying beneficiary. My dad is more than 50% Hawaiian, which makes me qualifying in terms of being able to succeed. But I have, I, I think we have still a lot of Kuleana to go stand up Hawaiian. So, I mean, Blood quantum is just the most divisive thing. Um, I think it's hurtful more than it is helpful. And I think that our community is better than gauging how Hawaiian we are based on this foreign concept of 
how much blood you have. And I know that there are, in spirit, hundreds of thousands of, you know, heart native Hawaiians who embody, it is all that it means to be a Hawaiian, regardless of it. So I know this is getting a little like more philosophical than anything, but I just, it, you're asking me from a personal level, I think that addressing the, the blood quantum and bringing down successorship is a start. And that amendment's already been passed and I think it's waiting, so. Okay, great. Um, well, we only have a few minutes left, so maybe we'll try to address some of these questions um, rapidly. Um, first, are there any private developers working with DHHL to make more affordable rentals? Could you describe your current efforts to work with those private developers? Yes, we are. Um, Stanford Car is the developer doing the affordable rentals at um, the former Bowler Drum site. Um, and I think if I think it's a good model. I know we haven't really done a huge foray into it. So I think it, I don't wanna say it's gonna be the template, but I think we are open to any other developer coming forward with a project that actually pencils. Um, yeah. Okay. And um, we also know that your department um, has an exemption from zone, zoning. So can you describe um, if there are any adjustments to building and zoning codes to take advantage of non-traditional construction techniques that your department is exploring? Well, okay. Going back to your question about working with the counties, you know, it's still important for us to maintain good and healthy relationships with the county systems. Flexing with our we're exempt from zoning uh, card, I would say is probably not the best like strategic decision, like, right, because the counties typically have their own, um, they've got their own sort of parameters that they're working through. So I would say that, you know, loosening the zoning restrictions on, for example, you know, non-traditional housing opportunities uh, can only benefit us, right? I mean, Yes, we could probably go in and say we're exempt and we don't have to do that. I don't know if that makes us the best neighbors. Um, so, you know, really any opportunity to amend the zoning code to be more relaxed to allow for more diverse housing options. I mean, we're, we're not gonna be opposed to that. And then speaking of other stakeholders, to what extent have you worked with um, the labor unions on non-traditional construction uh, methods? Um, you know, I feel, I don't feel totally equipped to answer that question. I do, do know that we have positive relationships with the union, uh, the labor unions, and I think we strive to continue to maintain those. Um, whether or not we've approached better ways to utilize those relationships, I can't really speak to them because I haven't, I mean, the last year and a half has been maybe a, a non-traditional tenure at the department, given everything everyone's going through right now. So, I mean, I don't really know the answers to that question, but I do, I, what I do know from my limited um, sort of experience there is that at the very least, we have positive working relationships and we have the support of the labor unions very often. And, you know, we strive to support them in providing development opportunities. But beyond that, I'm not really sure. Okay, great. Well, um... We're unfortunately at almost an hour here. So I wanted to thank you again, um, DHHL Deputy Tyler Gomes for appearing on our webcast today. Um, thank you for your leadership in the department and for your sincere passion in addressing the housing shortage among the native Hawaiian community. And I look forward to working with you in the future as well. Yeah, Mahalo well, for having us. Thank you very much. All right, thank you everyone for joining today. That concludes our presentation and we look forward to seeing you at our next broadcast of Our Homes Ending the Housing Crisis.